It is time for a visit with a person of high strangeness. Today we're going to take you um, outside of the studio to a place in Cosmopolis called the Cooney Mansion. And the hostess here has graciously allowed us to do an update with Jim Clarkson that you are familiar with. And if you remember, we did a, um, a two-part show on ufology today. And we had ran out of time and didn't tell you the June Carver story. So today, this is our exclusive interview that we couldn't work in. Then I believe you remember Barbara McGuire. Mm -hmm. And I said that she would be um, almost a regular, like almost like a co-hostess. And that's because um, Barbara and I do a lot of things together. And she's so knowledgeable. So without rehearsal, we can just say, come on, Barbara, let's go. and. And off we go. Hi, Jim. How are you? I'm doing great today, Lillian. Would you happen to know the date? Today? Uh-huh. Oh, I think we're up to about February 4th, I would imagine. Okay. The last time I talked to you, it was the 21st of January, and it snowed like crazy. It sure did. Mm -hmm. That was quite a day. Yeah. Quite a journey just to get from uh, where we live up to the studio. And so you changed the weather for us today? So it would be somebody did. Somebody did. It's wonderful. Great yeah. weather today. Mm -hmm. it, it was still stormy when we left Olympia, but um, well, anyway, I guess without further delay, we're just going to um, let J let James tell us about uh, June Carver. We're not going to. We are, excuse me. We are not going to interrupt you. Okay. And then, and then we'll chit chat about things later. And if we have a lot of time, we might even tell the story about the horse. That was one of the other questions. That is a good question, that and that's a good me. story in and of itself. Yeah. So maybe we just do the June Kaba story now. That would be wonderful. Well, the way that I met June Kaba was that in about 1993, I was doing a UFO lecture at the Ocean Shores Library. And after I was done with the lecture, this lady came up to me and started telling me that she knew for certain that UFOs existed because she had worked for the US government many years ago. And I started asking her questions as to how she knew these things. And right away, she clammed up. And she said that she didn't want to talk about it because she was afraid. Mm -hmm. And she did introduce herself to me as June Kaba. And I did a little bit of research and found out that she was basically a pillar of the community in Ocean Shores. She was a very independent and outspoken woman, and largely through her efforts was the fact that the Ocean Shores Library even existed, because they did not have a library until June Kaba basically mobilized a lot of other powerful people in the community. I do have a question for you. Since you investigated, we might want to touch up um why that's kind of normal for you. Would you like to inject that here for a minute? Oh, you mean how, why I'm an investigator? Yeah, exactly. Well, at this particular point in time, I have 24 years experience in law enforcement in the state of Washington. I've been a uh, military policeman in uniform, a plainclothes military police investigator. After I received my discharge, I was a reserve deputy sheriff for Thurston County. I was a uh, Thurston County Correctional Officer, and back in May of 1979, I started with the Aberdeen Police Department. And I'm coming up on 20 years with that agency. And just to make sure that no feathers are ruffled, I have to say that no law enforcement agency endorses anything that I'm discussing today. This is strictly on my own mm -hmm. when I put my other hat on, which is that I'm a state section director for the Mutual UFO Network. And I'm basically in charge of investigations in Grays Harbor County and the vicinity for MUFON. And there are a few of us down here who are active members. And there have been a number of cases over the years that I've been very fortunate to investigate, which June Kaba is probably, mm -hmm. there's only one other case that's probably as important as the June Kaba story. And that, of course, was the crash in Westport uh, near the Elk River Bridge on November 25th of 1979. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, we might want to talk about that a little more in detail later, but exactly. I just wanted to, uh, for, for the friends that didn't see the first two shows, and I, I thought it might be a good idea to... Well, those are my credentials. I've there. had uh, probably 1,200 hours of state authorized training in the area of criminal investigations, and I would add that 
when I investigate anything related to UFOs or the paranormal, oddly enough, it, this isn't magic or anything else. You just basically handle it the way you would any other investigation. You interview witnesses, try and collect evidence, uh, logically put things together and try to make it so that anyone can understand what it is that you're talking about. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's real straightforward stuff. There's nothing you no know, really complicated about it. Okay, so we'll get uh, back to the June back story. Back to the June story, okay. Well, there was an interruption in the June story because I basically didn't hear from her because she told me that someday she would come to me and tell me her story. Mm -hmm. And in the back of my mind, I always believed that she would, but I also knew with June, it was very obvious that she had a very strong will and that there was no way that I was going to pry the story out of her. She would have to come to me or it wouldn't happen. Well, courtesy of the United States Air Force and their public relations campaign in 1997, that happened. And what happened was that right before the 50-year anniversary of the Roswell crash, that would have been July 4th of 1997. About a month before that, the Air Force came out and said, now we're going to tell you the truth, as if anybody would believe them. But they said that they were going to finally admit that, yes, indeed, this was a crash top secret weather balloon. And all that anybody ever saw was pieces of a down weather balloon. And oh, by the way, we happened to put a, a couple of dummies on some of our balloons and the dummies crashed in the desert and those are what people mistook for aliens. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I was on the boat when they did that and got a lot of flack. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think there, uh, I went on the internet and went on to one of the news polls mm -hmm. to see how the public was reacting to that disclosure and when I voted that I didn't believe one thing that the Air Force had said it was running about five or six to one. The public didn't believe it either. But, you know, that's the age we live in. Nobody believes anything anymore from the government. It's a very sad state of affairs. But, I mean, from the highest mm -hmm. levels to the lowest levels, there's a credibility gap. Yes. There is a search engine on the Internet. It's called Periscope, P-E-R-A-S-C-O-P-E. -E. And they do um, a weekly poll, and you find things of that nature. Is that why you did I'd like call? to see that. No, mine, I did mine on uh, one of the big news agencies. It was like CNN or something like that on the internet. Well, in any event, all at once, out of the blue, I get this phone call. And it's June. And she's hopping mad. And she says, I don't care. I'm going to tell my story. I've decided it's time. And the sad part of this is, in the meantime, she had had a serious bout with cancer, and her cancer was in remission. So I think that she realized that she was coming down to the close of her life. And as she told me, she said, what are they going to do? Shoot me? Put me in prison? She says, I've, I'm 70-some years old. I've had cancer and survived it. She had outlived two husbands. Uh, she decided that it was time to tell her story. And she just didn't care anymore if they came after her. So she, I was very flattered because she said, Jim, you're the one I want to tell my story. And she even went so far as to drawing up papers through her attorney. And I have a letter on file through, his, through that office saying that I have permission to tell her life story. And so that's what I've done. And she also gave me all of the personal papers that she had left, which proved that she worked at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, between the years 1943 at 1952 and she was employed off and on the times when she wasn't employed there were because of uh, illness or her husband being moved around and then she ended up coming back and working there again and she even met her husband who was a military policeman who was guarding the base or a security policeman I don't know what they mm -hmm. called them back then but the interesting thing is that when you look at her papers it doesn't say Department of Defense it says War Department. Mm -hmm. And for anybody who knows U.S. history, there hasn't been a War Department since World War II. That's right. Mm -hmm. And these papers, when you hold them up, these are obviously 50-year-old pieces of paper. I don't think, there's no doubt in my mind that she is who she says she was. Mm -hmm. uh, she had that background. She did work there. And amongst the other things, uh, for instance, one of the description, her job description, indicate that she maintains by subject matter 
unit files of technical orders and under that technical instructions and other related matters. And in order to understand the June story, you have to realize that all of the technology that we take for granted now did not exist then. There were no personal computers. Uh, she worked in an office. She basically would have, now we would call her an office manager. Back then she was just a secretary or a clerk because obviously women were not given, you know, high positions of responsibility and trust as civilian employees, even though, as we all know, if you go into an office, if you want to know what's really going on in any office, who is it in the office who knows everything about everybody? It's the secretary. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. She's an integral part of the organization, and very seldom is she appreciated. Well, I'm sure that it was no different in this group, but what's interesting, this group was involved in confidential research and secret research. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base was the hub for researching foreign technology from the United States military, and the goal of foreign technology is to pick up whatever you can and basically retro-engineer it and figure out how we can take advantage of it or how, if it's an enemy aircraft or an enemy weapon, how can we figure out a defense? So their work is absolutely secret. She was involved in the original invention of things like parachutes, ejection seats, gun sight aperture cameras, uh, how, for instance, how to drop a bulldozer on a battlefield from a parachute. Now, there's a lot of engineering that goes into that. That's not an easy thing to do, and people had to do this through trial and error. They had serious engineers and scientists who worked on this year after year to get it right. She described in here how the man who originally invented the ejection seat went through horrible personal agony because the first few times that they tried the ejection seats, they didn't work, and it killed the test pilot. Mm -hmm because it blew him through a, ha through a cockpit that hadn't blown off the plane uh. yet. The timing has to be perfect. You have to blow the canopy and then blow the ejection seat. If you get it wrong, the man is dead. Mm. She told me about simple things where troops, paratroopers, would be educated in how to carry their equipment when they were dropped from a parachute, but the troops decided they didn't want to listen to the technical orders, and they were doing things like taking a entrenching tool out of their backpack and packing it down here because mm. it was more comfortable. Mm. And a lot of them were killed when they hit the ground because they didn't obey their technical orders. And she was involved in all of that. Wow. She was in charge of a dozen safes. Okay? And the, mm. the goal with those safes was all of that information is top secret or higher. And all security organizations run on two principles. You have to have a classif security classification that allows you access to the information, and secondly, you have to have a need to know. Mm -hmm. So her job was to make sure that anybody who got into those documents had the right classification mm -hmm. and that they had a need to know what the, to have access to those documents. Now today, of course, this is all done by computers, mm -hmm and passwords, and levels of encryption, and firewalls, and all the things that we have, but none of that existed. So this all had to be done by having a person like June in a position of trust. And the reason I'm telling you that is to show you that she was a very, very responsible person who had a difficult job. Mm -hmm. She was also very proud of the fact that along the way, she was personally responsible for catching a spy. Oh. Yeah. It sounded like a movie to me, but after she told me the story several times, I realized that it was true. She knew of this other woman who worked in the office who had a lot of personal expenses and whatnot because of illness, and she needed a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And this woman was privy to plans related to supplying our troops in the Southeast Asian theater. In other words, the island hopping that was going on, mm -hmm. trying to get close to Japan to turn the war against the Japanese. Right. It became obvious after a while that this woman was checking out papers and some of them were not coming back the way they should or they were kept overnight. So she didn't do anything, you know, uh, spectacular, but she did the right thing. She went to the provost marshal 
and they kept it all secret. And then one day she came to work, and this woman's desk was wrapped in this security tape, mm -hmm. and they came and took the desk away. And at one point, uh, right before this, she described how she was walking home, and they had a prearranged signal, and a car started following her. And she had a whistle that she was given. Mm -hmm. She blew the whistle, and all at once, all these government cars came out of nowhere, and they stopped this car that was following her and took the people inside of it away, and she never saw them again. And she never saw this woman again either. Mm -hmm. Clearly, the woman was, was taken as an enemy agent, and mm -hmm. I don't know what happened to her. One thing about the June story that's interesting to me is that she never altered her story. She told many of these stories to me several times. She mm -hmm. didn't embellish her story. She didn't make herself out to be the, the heroine of the story. And she didn't try to tell me that she knew more mm -hmm. than what she did. She wasn't trying to say, I have the answer to the UFO puzzle. In her own humble way, mm -hmm. she was telling me the story of her life and giving me an insight that I wanted to share with everyone else. I remember uh, we used to talk about it occasionally, and she didn't really care whether you even liked her or not. She That's just, true, too. You know, she just needed somebody to, you know, and yet she get was, that information mm -hmm. out. Yeah. She's a very loving and kind person, and for all that she had been through, that's what really impressed me, too, because her house was near the canal on Ocean Shores, down at the south end of this long, long island that's Ocean Shores, for those who aren't familiar with the Washington area. And her home had become a haven for wildlife. And while I was sitting mm -hmm. there getting these stories from her and taping these interviews, I'd watch all the raccoons and possums come up and, mm -hmm. and the mother raccoon taking care of her babies. And she had birds and doves and, mm -hmm. and everything else. She had had a very hard life, but she was always reaching out and wanting to be kind to other people and do, doing what was right. She, uh, her first husband, was killed in a traffic accident right in front of her house in Portland, Oregon. And they had had very difficult marital trouble. And I was, uh, I tried to take down all these dates so that I would know. Excuse this me. was on uh, February 15th of 1957. And her husband was killed by a drunk driver. He was changing the license plates on the car in front of their home. And a drunk driver plowed into the car, and he was basically run over by his own vehicle. Uh -huh. Her son was almost killed in the same accident. And she raised her son by remodeling houses in the Portland area. She showed me pictures of all these houses. And she had learned how to do carpentry. She'd had people teach her. And then she would carry the bank loans on these houses and mm -hmm. give people a chance to buy a house where the banks wouldn't lend them the money. Wow. So she was she was a very, very Wonderful. special woman. She was not, you know, mm -hmm. she's, I haven't met very many people like June. She's very, very dear to me. But well, get, oh. Well, excuse me, I guess she should have been in the history books and since that didn't happen. So by doing the show, we'll just add her into the local history. That's right. How's that? That's, so. that's more than fair. Yep. And this is exactly there what June go. wanted. This is great, yes. Mm -hmm. She the, deserves it. Precisely. Mm -hmm. She had one other, shall we say, brush with, with fame. She told me that she took dictation from Werner von Braun. And Dr. Werner von Braun, who was one of the fathers of American rocketry, he was brought over here. Uh, Werner von Braun denies being at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, but it would be very logical that he must have been there at some point because that is the location where the German scientists were brought in mm -hmm. under Project Paperclip, which at the end of World War II, where we, we and the Soviets were in a race to see who could grab the most German scientists and engineers. And I think, you know, you could argue, well, how moral is this or how good was it, etc. But on, these people were given a very good deal. They were brought over to the United States basically without much choice. Mm -hmm. But once they were here, and they were here for several years, if they cooperated, and worked for the government. They were eventually given full citizenship, jobs, mm -hmm. many opportunities. They certainly would, you know, anybody would call it a more than a good deal. From what I understand now, I did not verify this. This is, we just sometimes have rumors. I want to say that in, you know, in our circles. But from rumor has it that his offspring, his, his family, 
now has an estate not too far from Mount Rainier. Um, that would be interesting to pursue. Uh, yeah, maybe we look into that. Yes, I, I had heard that a, a, a while back. Um, yeah. well, I wonder if they would know this part of the background. It Probably. doesn't appear in his, bi his biography. Yeah. But she insists that she was taken to a high security area, and she said that the, part, the first thing that struck her as unusual was this captain that she knew who escorted her to where Dr. Werner von Braun was under basically a security lockup, was that when he came to get June, he was wearing a sidearm. And she had never seen this officer wear a sidearm before. And she said that when they went there, there, of course, were armed guards outside of the place. I don't know what a sidearm is, and I'm sure some of the friends don't. It's a gun. A Only forty-five a pistol. pistol. Oh, a pistol. Okay. A, 40, a, for, a USGI forty-five auto would be what would be issued normally for an officer to wear a sidearm. And the important part is, though, that she went in there and she, she took three hours of dictation from Dr. Werner von Braun. And then her job was to clean it up because his English was good, but it wasn't perfect. Like mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, she was able to do that and make it into a good format. And this is something I remember when June told me this story, there were tears in her eyes because she said that this major that she worked for came to her and said, June, if you never do another thing in your life, you've had your moment in history. Mm -hmm. Because this report was a secret report being sent to Congress to get an appropriation of $600,000 to found the United States space program. Oh, wow. my. So that, mm. this was a very, very important moment that has been not recorded anywhere else. That's right. And this was her, you know, basically mm -hmm. her moment in the sun, which I guess we're now giving her it's posthumously. Exactly, yeah. The sad thing was that she really regretted was that because of the work that she had done, she was given an opportunity to go to work for NASA. Mm -hmm. They even went so far, what whatever was the fledgling U.S. space program, they even went so far as to offer her husband a job. And of course, this wasn't the 90s, this was the 40s and 50s. And so a woman was not likely to counter the will of her husband, and her husband did not have much formal education. He didn't realize that he was being offered an extraordinary opportunity. Oh. So he basically shut down her ambition, and she went with him. And the other extraordinary thing about June that really speaks to her strength of will is that when I spoke about her working on houses, she put her son through Stanford University, and he graduated ROTC, uh, she, may, she was able to help him pay his tuition to get through. The part about this that makes this even more extraordinary is that after June Kaba had quit working at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, she, in 1954, she had an ectopic pregnancy that almost killed her. And of course, that's a serious medical condition mm -hmm. even now, but back then it was even more so. And because of almost hemorrhaging to death, she became partially blind. Mm. And she explained to me how she saw the world. And she had gone all of these years only seeing part of the world. She had a different perception because she was missing part of her field of vision for many, many years. And right before she died, a few months before, she underwent some surgery and it was sort of like a gift from God because all at once she got back the sight that she had been missing all those years. Uh -huh. So for her last few months, she was able to see far better than she had for many, many years. Hmm. Too bad it was so close to her, the time for her to go. Exactly. Yeah. But then I need to come to the heart of the story. Now that I've explained to you a lot about June mm -hmm. and a lot about who she was and her background, this is the part that would be of most interest to anyone who's interested in UFOs. Because if you believe this description and who she was and where she worked, then the next part of this story is the most important of all. She knew a man, a master sergeant, who was flying transport planes into Wright-Patterson 
Army Airfield. Mm -hmm. She could not remember, of course, she's 70 some years old, she's been through a lot, and she could not come up with his last name. She remembered him as Master Sergeant Clarence, and I was even able to get a photograph of a wedding that she attended, and it was his Master Sergeant Clarence's wedding. And of course now, if he's even still alive, he would be an old, old man. Mm -hmm. He came to June one day, and bear in mind that June works in an office where everybody has what they called a Q-level security clearance or above. And the situation is, this is a normal work day, they're having coffee in a meeting room before they're going to work, and in comes Master Sergeant Clarence to chat with the ladies. Mm -hmm. And he says, you'll never guess what I did last night. And they, of course, all say, well, what did you do? And he says, last night I flew in from New Mexico and I brought back bodies and pieces of a saucer. Mm -hmm. Now, this, to me, is a real revelation. I've read all the UFO books over the years, but I have never actually met someone who told me something like that, who was absolutely serious. Mm -hmm. And she said that he described them as being bluish green, they were very short. Now, this wasn't a long conversation, so she's not sitting there telling me, well, Master Sergeant Clarence drew me a diagram of what the aliens exactly, look yeah. like, or nor is she telling me, well, he took me into a secret area and showed me the bodies. No, that's not it. What follows that is what's really interesting. She recalls very clearly that later on that same morning, everybody in her office had to read what was called a two-hot memo. And a two-hot memo is a memo from the commanding officer of the base that no one is allowed to put down on their desk. In other words, it's too hot to just leave it on your desk. They had a courier who delivered it from person to person, and everybody had to acknowledge that they had read it and would comply with it. And this memo said there have been rumors circulating around the base about flying saucers and little men. You will cease talking about that immediately. And then it went on to quote all the security regulations and how they were subject to a $20,000 fine and being put in prison. That was a lot of money then. It's a lot of money Ooh, now, wee. but back then it would be a fortune. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> but this is one of those situations like um, in the Shakespeare play where the, the line, the lady doth protest too much. Why would the commander of the base even care if all of this is just rumor? Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's it. And the other problem with all of that is that in this particular room full of people, this particular group that she worked in, are engineers and scientists. And she talked to me about how they were trying to launch and test something called the Aero B rocket, which I had never heard of. A-E-R-O-B-E-E. -E -E. And the Aero B rocket, it turns out, I'm not going to open the book, but just to show you that it does exist, this is an old Encyclopedia Britannica that June gave me. And because in here it talks about how the Aero B rocket was one of the first rockets that the United States tested for launching payloads up about 130 miles to 150 miles into space. But the remarkable part was that she said that amongst these scientists and engineers, when they came back, they weren't talking so much about the rocket. They were talking about all the things that they had seen flying mm -hmm. around in the desert while they were there. The impression that June was left with was that they thought that they were under surveillance. Mm -hmm. And if you go back and check the UFO histories, you'll see that there are Numerous documented accounts of strange glowing fireballs, discs, all sorts of odd craft by credible people. Mm -hmm. And the thing that she emphasized to me over and over again was that amongst these engineers and scientists, there was no question that we were being visited by extraterrestrial intelligence. <laughs> that was not even a question. What they wanted to know was, what are their propulsion systems and how can we take advantage of it? Those are things that engineers and scientists would be intensely interested in. But they weren't debating whether or not this was a real phenomena. For them, that was a done deal. It was a done deal a long time ago. And mm -hmm. what further makes this fascinating 
is that she told me that there were three crashes. Mm -hmm. And the reason that this is so exciting to me is that very few people know that. Mm -hmm. I've heard the same thing from Kevin Randall, the same thing from Stanton Friedman, and now it comes up again in the new Majestic 12 documents that have been released through Joe Firmage and his group. It doesn't talk about one crash in the desert. Mm -hmm. It talks about three. How would June know that? I That's heard about, right. excuse me. Sorry. I heard about that from the Hopis. I did. When yeah, the Native Americans knew that. They that did. They were, they that were there three were three crashes. crashes. Three of them. Yes, mm -hmm. they knew yeah, that. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I was told that by mm -hmm. somebody, older members. Mm -hmm. So there is one more piece at the heart of this puzzle. One other experience that June had that makes this a significant story. She had another officer come to her in her office one day, and he threw down this thing in front of her that was about the size of a business card, and it was slightly bent. Mm -hmm. And it was a bluish gray color. And June recalled the conversation. She said, what's that? And the officer said, it's a piece of a spaceship. And she laughed at him, and he looked at her very seriously and said, it's a piece of a spaceship. And then he said, go ahead, June, tear it up. Mm -hmm. So she attacked it with scissors. She said it was as light as a feather. She tried cutting it, she tried stabbing it, she tried scratching it, she tried denting it. Nothing had any effect on it. I asked her, I said, well, you've been around, you've seen a lot. <coughs> You know, since then, obviously, we have miracle plastics and aluminum and all these wonderful materials that we take for granted. And I said, have you ever, she said, I've never seen anything like that since. Hmm. I've never seen anything in the world that was like that piece of material. And see, once again, June didn't tell me that she got taken to some secret hangar and shown, you know, big pieces of UFOs, but she knew for certain that this man whom she knew and trusted had come to her and said, this is a piece of a spaceship. And those are the, what's at the heart of the June Kaba story. In other words, I don't believe that I have what's a, called a smoking gun here. I can't produce the bodies or uh, pictures of a spaceship or anything else. But what I can produce is that I knew June Kaba. I have the documents that prove who she was and where she worked. And I have her story transcribed. And I, based upon my pre professional reputation and knowledge, would swear in any court of law that what she told me was true and that she told me those things believing that she was going to die in the not too distant future. And the last time I checked, a dying declaration is admissible in any court of law in the world. This is true. Would you like some water? Yeah, I think I'm. That's probably a good idea. This is an informal discussion, so we don't have to. Mm -hmm. Could the lady in the audience bring us a glass of water, please? Thank you. Sorry. Oh, well, that's fine. We'll help you out here. That's Thank right. You. Just a minute here. Um, you know, uh, as you know, I'm a little intuitive, and so are you. Uh, a lot of weird things happened today. It's, it's uh, from the time we left. You know, it was it was just like the timing on this little interruption was sort of perfect. Uh, little things been happening ever since we decided to come here and, and do the June story. And so just as Barbara had her little coughing spell here, we realized that all the batteries on the equipment was dead. And um, so thank you for coughing, Barbara. Well, you're welcome anytime. Okay. Perfect timing. Yeah. So let's see. Where were we? Well, we were sort of coming to the close of the June story mm -hmm. on, you know, that's basically I've given you the heart of the matter and explained her background and, and why I think it's important. The reason that it fits into a larger, bigger picture is that right now, I believe one of the most important developments in many years is occurring in the field of ufology because of Joe Firmage and perhaps mm -hmm. some of the people who are watching this have heard about him in the news. He's in his late 20s. He's already had two extremely successful internet communications businesses. He's personally worth $28 million. And he's basically walked away from that. And he is devoting $2 million to backing up 
the research necessary to prove that the documents that they're investigating are real. Wonderful. On the, it is wonderful. On the national news, they said it was $3 million. Well, so we only offer million. Somewhere in between. Yeah. But the point being, no one, to my knowledge, has ever done this. And one of the things, of course, that has been crippling to UFO research is that it's done by volunteers. And unfortunately, they all have to eat, too. And they, it's very hard to make a living. They, they need to uh, publish books, lecture, do whatever's necessary to survive. And it's just not easy. You know, I have my own personal battle. I've, you know, I work at a regular job, and then I try to devote the spare time I have, what little there is, to pursuing what I really love. And this is the battle that we all fight. Uh, somehow, Lillian, you've managed to reconcile <laughs> that because you've just let the universe take care of you. It just shows up. It just shows up. A um, little insert here. Um, I, I smoke. Everybody knows I smoke. And I was down to four cigarettes one day, and I said, the universe, I'm almost out of cigarettes. And um, then I got a three-way call. You know, I did a three-way call. And I hung up on the phone, rang again, and the lady said, I was trying to call you. I didn't know if you, if you was home. Um, I brought you something, open your front door. And I did, and there was the carton of cigarettes. <laughs> that sounds like something that would happen to you. Yeah, things happen to her all the time. And, and you know, Brenda Roberts, uh, which you will meet uh, a little later, she allowed me to use a lot of her clips from her show. And Eilis, the coordinator for the U.S., if Brenda, Eilis, and myself had lived in one house, we couldn't have paid the light bill. Uh, David Adair, uh, just, just about everybody, you know, all us. We're not really brilliant, just knowledgeable people because we know we, we look for things. Um, sometimes we just live out of cartons. Um, Colin Andrews from the crop circles, he was moving from one person to the next person to the next person. And so our life is really exciting. Mm -hmm. It's just not easy, but there is, I did hear it say, said recently that one of the things that you have to do at some point is to chase your passion, not your pension. Mm -hmm. And yes. that's hard to do. It takes courage, but it's very important ultimately that you pursue your dreams and not just settling for something less than that. And it's not easy being green. There you go. Well, another thing, too, is I think people need to realize that it, it, you're not automatically given a paycheck when you're doing these kind of things. You're not automatically mm -hmm. funded by someone. But in, in order to get the information out, there has to be someone like, like Lillian that can just take a leap of faith and say, yeah, yeah. you know, here I am. I'm going to get as much of this <laughs> out as I can. Yeah. Or someone like June who had, you know, <laughs> yes. I don't know for sure whether the men in black would come and try to get her or whether they're going to come and try to get me for putting her story out. I guess the best insurance policy is to spread it to as many people as possible. Exactly. Uh, no one believes the government anymore anyway, so there's probably no great risk here. The fact that we're basically going against official Air Force policy is probably not going to upset them a whole lot, but if enough people begin to demand the truth, perhaps we'll make some headway. And I guess the, the one thing that I, I did need to say, just to kind of close out the June story, is that in telling this story to people, I am fulfilling a promise that I made to a very dear friend. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that I would say to her wherever she is, is the most beautiful word that I've heard. Someone taught it to me once, which, which is namaste. Mm -hmm. The God or light within me salutes the God or light within you. So June, wherever you are, namaste. Oh, this is your story. In the Mayan say, in Lakesh, that means mm -hmm. I am another you. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Isn't it wonderful? Mm -hmm. That is beautiful. Yeah. Beings of light. Yes. So we've finished with, with the June story? I believe so. Uh, let's see. Uh, we will. You have some photographs that. Um, yes, I do. That we can kind of. Uh, since this, since we're on location here, is some editing will have to be done. So we'll just put the. Um, I have a photograph of June mm -hmm. as a young woman, and this photograph is 50 years old and mm -hmm. worn, and uh, you can see the tear in it, and this was a, a, a beautiful picture of her when she was a young woman, and it sort of gives me some insight as to why some of these uh, 
male officers might have been telling her things that right. perhaps <laughs> they shouldn't have been talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, they wanted to impress her a little exactly. bit. Exactly. And the laws were what different in those days, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's another thing. People are, people are afraid to, to be friendly. We did a show, um, I believe it was that time jumper we did. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell me the time? Mm -hmm. And I had brought a media ride to the TV station. Oh, yes. Do you remember that? Yes. And uh, everybody handled this media ride. Now, this is a 90s type um, work environment place. And next thing you know, we was all hugging. It's like we stepped out of time and everybody was just grateful to see the next person. And so sometimes things, people and things do change how we look at things and um and it doesn't take very long sometimes for that mm -hmm. to happen yeah just yeah. just really great mm -hmm. um can we talk about the horse oh <laughs> I've been, yes let's I've talk, been wanting about to talk about the horse that's a wonderful story okay two years ago two years ago huh that's about right about right it's about the time that, well actually maybe a little more than that because it's not it's right about the same time that you and i met as i recall because that all happened that close, summer. So it'll be closer to three years. That's if, right. Let's see. Uh, we met in August of 1996. Six. And it's, yeah, about like that long ago. Anyway, I had a phone call wanting to know if someone could send a gentleman to me that was rather disturbed. And uh, <laughs> I said, sure, because lots of time I get people to talk to me that's disturbed. And um, this is the story he was telling. He had a couple of horses, no? Yeah, I believe he had two horses. And um, he kind of favored one a little over the other. And um, then the horse started getting really strange. It would lose enormous amounts of weight overnight, like 80 pounds, I believe he said. Uh, you can correct me because, you know, if- That's pretty much it. Yeah, if, if I don't remember it correctly. Anyway, and the horse would lose like 80 pounds, uh, sometimes over a short period of time, then get back to normal. And then he got, the gentleman got a little paranoid because it appeared like the horse was following him and watching him. That's what he called it. And um, then after a while, the horse did one of those 80 pound weight drops again. And so he called the veterinarian, a lady veterinarian, no? That's correct. Yeah. And so she said, well, since we don't know what's wrong with the horse, I would advise you to just put the horse to sleep. And it, it was late in the evening. He put the horse to sleep, and um, it, it was too late to remove the, I can't say that word, carcass. Exactly. Okay. And so they made arrangements to pick it up the next morning. That's correct. Yeah. They had a renderer coming. Exactly, yeah. So in the meantime, the gentleman feels really guilty because now he has put his horse to sleep. He thinks mainly because he's scared of it, because it's following him. So when they came the next morning and they had, had it covered uh, with a canvas or something? With a very large uh, blanket, kind of a horse blanket. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a horse body Almost bag. Almost like a tarp. Yeah. And so he wanted to say his goodbyes and he pulls the tarp back and here's the horse. Um, the eye socket had been removed. The description that I got, the, those are essentially the, the same details that I got. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the horse did not belong to him. It was being boarded at his place because he had pasturage and fenced in land. And the horse actually, I think, belonged to somebody who lived down towards Westport. And the horse had been there for quite a while. I mean, we're talking months. Mm -hmm. And they'd gone through all these strange you know, mm -hmm. weight losses and then plus there were descriptions of how the horse would look very oddly. The one, in fact, the woman who owned the horse was very upset by this whole thing because she said that the horse had undergone like a drastic personality change that she couldn't figure out. Ah, oh, see and that part I didn't know anything about. Yeah. The horse was put down by the veterinarian mm -hmm. and it was the renderer who called attention to it to this man who, was, who lived there because he came out the next morning. He was supposed to come out with his truck and mm -hmm. winch the horse up and and take it away. And he took one look at the horse and he said, wait a minute. And he called this man over and they looked at it. Mm -hmm. And it had uh, many of the classic characteristic signs of animal mutilation, which exactly. is a completely circular excision of the eye. We're not talking just the eye and the eyeball, but the whole orbit is gone, about like someone took a, uh, 
a laser mm -hmm. and just cut a hole there. And then plus, classically, the skin and muscle tissue was all excised from the head all the way back to the neck area. We don't, the, the, the other thing was the scene was essentially bloodless. That's exactly, another, no another thing that's very mm -hmm. eerie yeah. about these animal mutilations. Yeah. Right. But the part that really bothered me most about this was that I paced it off and it was only about 90 feet from this man's house and it was very hot that night and they all had their windows open. Exactly, yeah, it, it, it was in a wet barn, wasn't it? Well, it was outside, it was within walking short mm -hmm. distance of a barn, but it was basically out on the out in the open in this yard, easy visibility from the house. There shouldn't have been any way that anybody could have come in there and done anything to that horse body That's and gotten right. away undetected. It right. doesn't seem reason, reasonable at all. The bad part about this whole thing is that unfortunately, although everyone involved was very disturbed about this, mm -hmm. they went on ahead when they were done and let the renderer take the horse away. Yeah. So when I heard about it, I was ready to grab my camera and, and go out mm -hmm. there and collect samples and do whatever I could to document mm -hmm. it. But there wasn't much there to document other than that he did take me out there mm -hmm. and he showed me where the horse had lain in the grass and I did photograph that. And I could see where as the horse was in its uh, death agony that it, it had uh, vomited slightly and defecated and there were impressions in the grass that were consistent with a large animal laying there for a long period of time but that's you know all the direct evidence that i had other than that i had his story and the renderer's story and the story from the owner of the horse and all three of the stories were consistent with each yeah. other the man was very, very upset. They and didn't, um, They didn't take pictures, though, of him. No, they didn't. No. And, and then, of course, I referred him to you know, Mufano, or, or you personally, I believe. It right. Was, or and it turns thing. out that there have also been other ca animal mutilations here in Grace Harbor mm -hmm. County. But then I found out that some of them have occurred at dairies. Now, mm -hmm. the problem with that is they are very reluctant to report anything like this or let anyone investigate it because, obviously, they don't want people to think that the milk that they're drinking might be coming from, you know, some animal that was taken away and then mutilated. It creates a very bad image. Yeah, we have to be really careful here. Are we going to be like Oprah? We're going to be... But what's the right. <laughs> Well, there is no connection. I, no, I know. Yeah. There's I'm no connection between... These are... These are I, I should also <laughs> emphasize, just to be uh, yeah. safe, that... Um, you know, these animals are frequently taken when they are going, when they have died. Apparently, that was what was made these unusual, was the animal was put down, exactly. and then it was mm -hmm. mutilated. Okay, yeah. many of the other cases that are reported across the United States involve animals that are perfectly healthy one day, and the next day they're lying there mutilated. Mm -hmm. And now those are very, very hard. I don't know how you would even begin to explain something like that. Yes, that's that's the big question. It is the big question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is a book. It's uh, an Alien Harvest. Right, Linda Moulton Howe's book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it's not easy to to render a huge cow helpless. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, you know, I mean, gosh. And how do you do it with no footprints? Mm -hmm. and no blood. No blood. Well, it's apparent to me that apparently mm -hmm. when we're many of these mutilations involve three locations. There's the location where the animal was last standing. There's the location where the mutilation occurs. And then there's the location where the animal is dumped. And those appear to be, in many of these cases, three different distinct places. In other words, there's no evidence that the animal, animal was mutilated where it's found. Because there isn't any blood. There isn't any sign of a struggle. There isn't any activity there. There's no nothing in the area that would lead you to believe that anything happened other than that somebody dumped a mutilated cow there. And lots of times cults um, are being blamed for that. Oh, over and over again. Well, and, and predators. Now, now when um, I lived in Louisiana for a while, okay, and uh, we used to find mutilated animals, but we thought it was connected with, with a cult. And we had a three-bedroom house, and one night uh, my children and my husband were sleeping, and we was uh, raising dogs, they were, we called them bulldog, but they were pit bulls and dobermans. Somewhere along the line they had 
mixed and we realized that was a good breed of dog so we just kept it going and these 19 dogs they were just barking and barking and they woke me up and the house was very fluorescent you know typical type thing and um well i couldn't wake up anybody until much later so the next day my husband and my son um we saw the something had landed uh, like a plane or, or something like that you see on a hill and they drove 23 miles there was no elevation anywhere so so it wasn't until much later that i made the connection between the mutilated animals that we found on a regular basis you know mm -hmm. and uh and whatever had been over my house yeah that's the part that's really eerie uh as a law enforcement officer the part that i find very strange about the animal mutilations is that on the one hand you have physical evidence mm -hmm. you have a carcass with unexplained mutilation and the absence of foot traffic the absence of a struggle exactly. the absence of blood all of that and on the other hand although there have been huge cash rewards offered for information leading to the arrest of people involved in this mutilation activity and despite the fact that there have been th thousands of such incidents no one has ever been arrested. Mm -hmm. right. Now that tells me it's not cults. They couldn't even find some poor cult member to drag in and question right. because they couldn't link the cult members to any of this activity. And I think that at the highest levels, they secretly know that this thing is either not readily ex explainable or they know what the explanation is and they don't want to talk about it. It's one of those two things. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think so, too. And especially when you take the reports from, like, the veterinary school in Oregon and Corvallis that say that the injury to the tissue is most consistent with a heat-induced injury. In other words, the tissue was cut with a laser, not with a knife. The fish at Vainucci. Ah, yes. Okay. Uh, at the time, I thought they had tried to make a crop circle, and they missed, remember? That's right. I, yeah. And uh, we covered it in one of the previous uh, segments that we did. You know, I took pictures of those fish. Now, this happened on the 20th of August. I took pictures of those fish on the 22nd of December. They were still microwaved. So it was heat-induced. Um, That's consistent The algae with must have been... It, it just fried the fish. I mean, it microwaved them. I believe that the, uh, the report that I got from the University mm -hmm. of Washington indicates that there was a sudden algal bloom. Mm -hmm. And the algae are better able to compete for the oxygen in the water than the fish are. And so basically the fish get choked out and they die. Mm -hmm. There's just a sudden overpopulation of this organism. And although it's a plant organism, they also respire mm -hmm. to a certain level. So the, basically they beat out the fish for the available oxygen in the water and the fish cannot survive. That is consistent with the water having been microwaved quickly exactly. and then cooling down. Mm -hmm. So the heat may not have killed the fish, mm -hmm. but the fact that their environment was drastically changed exactly. and allowed the algae to proliferate all at once, that's what killed the fish. Now. The strangest thing about all of that is that only one pond exactly. out of 60 was affected, and the owner, whose livelihood is raising those koi fish, mm -hmm. had never had a prior experience of a sudden algal bloom that took out all the fish in one of his ponds. He's had a fish die here or a fish die there. Exactly. That's fine. He's got 60 ponds with 12 to 20 fish in each one. We don't, nobody would find that surprising that occasionally he finds a floater. But to have a pond turn that ugly shade of rust brown overnight, and then the next day all the fish are floating belly up, that's surprising. And in December, they looked like you had put them in a microwave and just... Uh, well, even the predators uh, wouldn't uh, eat them. Yeah. So Some kind of way, this was a really fun show today. We went from, <laughs> from taking you on a tour to, to a microwave fish and... Um, and mutilated animals, but I had a, a lot of calls on, on the show that I did with Jim, so I, we wanted to answer some of your questions. 
in the coming months, I'm hoping to take you on location again in, in some of the other places around. Hopefully the sunshine where we can do some outside shots. Um, right now the wind has calmed down and the sun is trying to come out, but we have almost come to the end of our time here. And so we can't show you the sunshine today and you have to take our word for it. Um, thank you for dropping in. It's always a pleasure, Lillian. And thank you for going with me. Anytime. So I don't get lost on the way home. We, we did the <laughs> show on a time jump. And, and for the staff that made everything possible for us here, and our wonderful um, uh, camera person, Frank, thank you very much. And uh, so you just stay tuned and come and see us again next week. This is a photograph of June Kaba as a young woman. And as you can see, this type of photograph, it's almost 50 years old. It's a different kind of color tinting than we use now. It's a photocopy of the two photographs that June sent to another UFO researcher. And this is from Master Sergeant Clarence's wedding. He's the man who claims that he flew in with pieces of a saucer that had crashed and also with alien bodies.